pioneer means one who goes out and builds a road for others to follow. And there's always a risk when you're doing it first. I just wanted to go where there were a lot of challenges. I didn't know where, I didn't know what. But when I saw the coastline of Alaska, I think there was a marriage made between me and the country that was unreal. It was an adventure from the time I stepped off the train at 12.30, June 15th, 1935. It wasn't at all like I thought it was going to be. It was gorgeous. It was like another world. It was so beautiful. The fog was thick, and you saw prisms around every light, and echoes between every building as you walked in the crunching of the snow. Two weeks after I got to Alaska, I wrote to my mother and said, this is home. I've been here since 1935. And I came to create a farm, so I decided to settle in the Matanuska Valley, where they had an experimental farm, who were very helpful. They had a road into Anchorage and a market for the milk. So everybody's looking down their nose at this Chichaco from back east who bought their town newspaper. I wasn't accepted right away. The town was very small, 2,500 people. I had five employees and I had a daily circulation of 650. I was the editorial department, the advertising department. I was never busier in my life. Well, I first came to Alaska in 1931 because the building contractor that I had been working for in Texas saw no more blueprints coming in because of the Depression. So I bought a one-way ticket to Alaska. And in those days, I had to take the train to California, the train to Seattle, the steamboat, to Seward, and my uncle in the flying boat met me at Seward and brought me into Anchorage. I'm lucky enough to be a fourth generation Alaskan and I'm proud of it. My great grandfather uh, came over the, uh, the trail at Dawson looking for gold, found more gold seekers than gold, and decided to establish a business in 1898. I came to Alaska out of Kansas and I was looking for a country. I wasn't old enough to get my own passports and visas, which you needed. I was down to the White Steamship Company in, in Los Angeles, and I asked them, where could I go without all this paraphernalia? And they mentioned the Philippines and Guam and Puerto Rico and Virgin Islands and Hawaii, I think Panama Canal. I can't remember. The last place they mentioned was Alaska. And I said, uh, how far up in Alaska can I go? And I'll never forget this. It was August the 22nd. I remember the day. They said, well, if you'd come in here a couple of weeks ago, we could have taken you to Nome. But now as far as we can take you is, is Seward. I said, I'll go to Seward. <laughs> and so I bought a ticket, and uh, it wasn't all that easy. I had to borrow money a couple of times along the way. Fighting made it to Seward. But Seward wasn't the place. You had to go to Anchorage. And so uh, the third man I asked for $10 in Seward, it was a cold night of November 1940. He gave it to me, and uh, I arrived in Anchorage. <laughs> my grandparents uh, made the race into Oklahoma when the Cherokee Strip opened, and my parents moved out to New Mexico while it was still a territory before it became a state. And I guess uh, I always wanted to come to Alaska before it became a state. My father uh, came to Alaska in 40 to become a radio announcer for a radio station at Fairbanks KFAR. I've lived in Anchorage, Alaska since 1941. I came here prior to the war and my first uh, employment was with the Anchorage School District. At that time there were 23 teachers encompassing the entire district. Hitler was on the rampage in Europe. Admiral Tojo was on the loose in the Pacific and the United States became concerned about the defenses of Alaska and uh, uh, we had just 200 troops in all of Alaska stationed at Chukut Barracks near Juneau. We had enormous potentials around here. The people appreciated it and wanted them used, and it took people. So we were always trying to get more people to come in here. And when the Army showed an interest in Alaska, we showed them why whatever they built in Alaska should be here. And we sold them the idea, and that's why Fort Richardson and Elmendorf are here. That's what made Anchorage. I came to Alaska the first time in 1948 uh, under contract with the U.S. Geological Survey flying a helicopter on a contract to map southeast Alaska. I remember one time I had a forced landing and after repairing the helicopter and rescuing the people that I had in the field, 
Uh, I spent the next day picking up some 40 or 50 people who were searching for us on foot. We had no radios in those days, and seeing those people walking around the hills looking for someone they didn't even know convinced me that Alaska was a great place. We discovered Homer, Alaska, which is uh, heaven as far as I'm concerned. I've been there, lived there since 1946. We had to uh, make a living, and I started a, a wild berry business. We picked the wild berries that grew in that area. Some of the youngsters in town helped us by picking the berries. It was an exciting business. We involved everyone in town eventually because even the mothers and fathers got to the point where they, uh, if they had a bad year in fishing, they would go out and pick their wild berries and bring them to us. In 1955, I came to Alaska with a pregnant wife and a dog in heat, driving the Alaska Highway. Well, I came to Alaska in 1951. Uh, as a matter of fact, I came up on one of the old Boeing Stratocruisers as a young man. A very wonderful airplane. I thought this was really the beginning of something great. And I uh, was looking for the uh, gigantic Anchorage Airport. And as we landed, we landed in the north-south runway of Elmendorf Air Force Base. Got off the plane, went into the little shack, a pot-bellied stove, 15 or 20 people around, and came into Anchorage on a old airport limousine. I think it was probably built out of a hearse. I came to Alaska with my parents in the early 50s. Uh, my father was following construction work and uh, we came out of Los Angeles. So it was quite a shock to a teenage boy of, uh, of 15 years old. While I was in high school, I was able to buy an airplane that was wrecked and uh, rebuild it in high school and start flying. I had my uh, private license when I was uh, uh, 17 years old and my uh, had the opportunity to fly as a co-pilot uh, in the bush, 1958, at statehood time. Flew with Muck Puck Marston and Bob Bartlett uh, all over the Yukon and Kuskokwim River areas campaigning for Alaska statehood. We had a statehood bill back here, but it wasn't giving us any land or anything, nothing to amount to any 23 million acres. I was building a house on 12th and G, and I just took my overalls off and said, I'm going to see the President of the United States and Senator Taft. And I had never been to Washington. And I went back there, and you're from Alaska, and it, it, it's, a, it's a different thing. I never saw the president, but I saw the vice president twice, and I literally spent five days in Senator Taft's office. He listened. We were taxed without representation. We had all these th situations where we were treated as colonials. Now we're free of that. And it's because we went through all these experiences and fought for it, and we did it. And it's the people of Alaska who did it. The most appealing thing at that time uh, was the fact that you were going to go up to a place that was brand new and just starting. It had, uh, it had only been a state for four years. Alaska had only been a state for four years at that time. Uh, the oil industry was just in its infancy, just starting. And there were very few places in the world at that time that you could go uh, as a young person uh, and have that much opportunity, just kind of a, the blank uh, blackboard waiting for you to start writing on it. I came to Alaska 10 years ago because it seemed so full of adventure and interesting people and interesting things, and I sort of thought it was as close as I could come to California during the gold rush. I first arrived in Alaska in 1975 to work on the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. After working there for three and a half years with the completion, I have become so in love with the place I decided to remain here and start a business, and since that time I have been active in uh, practicing professional engineering. Well, I came to Alaska because it was a drawing, a calling. I feel that the pioneers felt something similar. I drove up here from Atlanta, Georgia in a 66 Ford Mustang. I broke down 10 times in 11 days. But I was determined to make it here because I believed in Alaska for what she stood for. And I believed in myself and what I was going to do. Pioneering is not restricted to a particular period in Alaska's history, nor is it, uh, nor is it confined to age. A pioneer is an interesting mixture of a whole lot of things. We had some kind of a curiosity about seeing beyond what we already knew. A pioneer is one that goes ahead of the main army and prepares the trail. I can remember back in the middle 50s, I was with a trucking company in Fairbanks called Alaska Freight Lines, and the owner of that, a fellow named Al Gezzi, said, we're going to go north with the trucks and the cats and everything. It was long before they had a road, and we built our own road to the, to the north slope, and uh, that was a real risk. And, those things still go on, always will go on up there, I believe. I like to go into an area and and change it a little bit, start things and 
get them rolling and then go on and start something else. Pioneers have to have faith, tenacity, determination, integrity, vision, a spark of adventure, good health. Believing that you have what it takes, not afraid to, to risk. Be inventive. Be a dreamer. And you have to have the strength of your convictions. You have to be able to see through the tough times. Anybody can be a pioneer who has imagination, a dream, perseverance, and a vision of how to accomplish it. I used to tell people in, uh, in the South 48 that in Alaska, the only thing that prevents anybody from doing what they want to do is the fear of God and lack of money, and the latter can always be solved. The opportunities for young Alaskans are incredible, and, and they're all over the place, and, and I think it's just the beginning. It's the dynamics and the interaction of the people that live up here and the excitement of, of forging a, a new place to live. We have better educational facilities, larger. The school is, you know, the school has more to offer, and uh, that uh, we're in the beginning of uh, the development of some of the resources of Alaska. Opportunity still continues to exist today, and the, the spirit that we're seeing of people who have had it made, being willing to help new people come along is tremendous up here. And that's, that's like the old barn raising spirit. Alaska is one of the greatest states in the United States for just about anything you want to do. You can plan things and you can start it, and it depends. I mean, the success is depending on you. We're uh, still on the uh, beginning stages of real development in Alaska. The opportunity here will be unsurpassed for the individual that truly wants to apply himself. I believe the opportunities are greater now than they ever were. It's just up to us to, to form them, shape them, and put them together. It's never too late to be a pioneer. The horizons are limitless. You say, is the spirit of adventure still here? I say it's all over the place. This public service message featuring the pioneering spirit of the people of Alaska is presented by Alaska Pacific University, where pioneering meets tomorrow's challenge.